he doesn't mind reading from the outliers, but I'm going to skip through some of this because that's. Um, what I do want to bring up is another issue that seems to come up a lot. Somebody says, well, I want a broad gene pool. So they buy some Russians, and they buy some Carniolans, and they buy an Italian, and they buy a, a BSH, and they buy a, a Minnesota hygienic, and they put them all in the same bee yard, and, and that's fine, you can put them all in the same bee yard, but you start crossing all these up, that's not necessarily going to be a great outcome. <coughs> if, if you have trouble picturing that, picture this. You, you, you take a... You, you take a dachshund and you cross it with a German Shepherd. What are you going to get? A very weird, very ugly dog. It might be really sweet and wonderful, but probably not what you were looking for. Um, the, the fact is mixing up a whole bunch of different breeds is not how you maintain a broad gene pool. The way you maintain a broad gene pool is you start with what things have kind of evened out to in your area from the feral bees and you, keep, and you, and you maintain as many of those lines as you can. In other words, if every year you catch a couple of swarms, you do a couple of cutouts, you've brought in some more genetics, but that's genetics from the local bees. Genetics that are part of this, this subspecies that has started to develop in your area because they are surviving, they have the right traits, so on and so forth. You want something that's reasonably homogenous or you can't even predict what your outcome is going to be. You know, if, 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 I don't know, it's hard to come up with a horse illustration that's like that, but let's say I take a a Shetland pony and I, and I cross it with a Clydesdale, what am I going to get? Who knows? But it, it's probably not the right thing to do. It, it, now, if I cross the Clydesdale with another workhorse, I might end up with a really nice horse. Who knows? But the point is, just mixing up genes isn't how you get a broad gene pool. That's how you get some really weird mongrels that doesn't necessarily help your breeding program. Does that make sense? I know a lot of people get very confused on this, and, and um, really, I... The best bees you're going to get are the local feral bees. If you can catch them in swarm traps, if you can do cutouts, you know, I, I don't really recommend doing a lot of cutouts for free, but I'd be willing to do a couple of cutouts for free to get you, if you're, if you're just trying to get to where you have some feral bees. Um, but in the end, I think most people doing cutouts ought to charge because it's just too much work and there's also too much risk in the sense that yeah, people are unpredictable, you know. Yeah. You go cut a hole in their wall, and the next thing you know, they're trying to sue you. And and so, um, some of the worst predicaments I've ever been in were doing cut up. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of they're kind of. You really ought to put it, put together a contract that specifically says you're not going to fix the hole in the wall. And in fact, <coughs> most places, uh, unless you're out in the country, especially in almost any city, you have to be a licensed contractor to fix that hole in the wall. And so you do not want to be doing that. Um, you want to, besides who wants to do that, you just want the bees. So get the bees and get out. That's what you want to do. So get a contract that says that. That says you're, you're going to cut a hole in their wall. You're not going to fix the hole in their wall. And you're going to take the bees. And you're not going to guarantee that, new, that more bees aren't going to move in because that's up to the contractor who seals this up to make sure that the bees can't get back into the cavity. Um, and then you're kind of off the hook at least. You still don't know how people will react, but at least you've defined it. Right? Be back. Be back to, in a to, bowl. to get the very last of them. Um, <laughs> okay, qu any, any more questions about the whole bee concept? Yeah. When you do a walkaway split from a hot hive, what have you seen happen with the old queen and the brood you create? Or did you put with her? Well, the old queen's still in the other half of the walkaway unless I find her and kill her, <laughs> um, which is what I would do, but. Um, or I put her in a nuke for the time being until I see where things are going and see how things turn out. Um, but it, it's hard. It's hard to predict. But I'd say the majority of the time, if I if I take a hot hive and I take the queen out and I, don't, and I let them raise another queen, usually they're much nicer. I, I wouldn't guarantee that. It's a better guarantee probably to introduce some different genetics, but. Yeah. But if I really have some genetics here I like otherwise, you know, they've been surviving in a tree for 20 years and, they, and they're pretty productive and everything else I like about them, I, everything, I like everything about them except that they're too hot, I might, I might just take the queen out and let them raise another queen and see how that goes. Because I don't really, I'd rather keep that line going if I can. Um, so that, that, and usually that works, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes that daughter queen is just, you know, her bees are just as vicious as the, as the mother queen. Oddly enough, 
I don't know how to explain this, and I'm not trying to explain it. I'm just trying to. I'm just going to tell you what I, what I've experienced. But I have requeened a hot hive, and had them calm down almost instantly. And this leads me to a couple of theories. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that either theory totally explains everything. But I've, a couple of theories on why, why that might be. Um, one of them is that maybe these bees are more sensitive to the state of the pheromones in the hive, and when I introduce the new queen, it fixed the pheromone state, and so now they're happy. I don't know. And maybe it's the, that there was something, that queen was starting to fail or something, and their reaction to that queen starting to fail is to get vicious. I'm not really sure, but, but I can't explain it any other way, because if I put a new queen in there, none of the bees have been replaced, and they're the ones who are suddenly nicer. So... You know, it takes it takes a good six weeks to replace most of the bees in that colony with the with the bees from the new queen, and yet they calm down much sooner than that. They calm, sometimes they calm down like within two or three days. So I'm, I don't have an explanation for that other than a theory, and my theory is that maybe they're just more sensitive to the fact that that queen was failing, and now that I've given them a new queen, they're happy. Now that may also fix the problem with the with the mother daughter thing. Maybe if they're mad and I. Because she's failing, I take her out and they raise a new queen. Now they're happy because she's making enough pheromones. You know? Yeah? The reason that uh, happens, where I used to talk with Rutten and Brother Adam and Wolfie and all them over in Europe, that was noted, was that by putting in a queen that has nothing to do with any of the subfamilies in the hive, to stop the subfamilies fighting over who's going to control that hive with a specific <coughs> Did you guys hear that and understand what she's no, saying? No, okay, she, she's oh, she's dynamic. Or the girls. Can I get that? Okay, okay. 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 Let's, let's let's talk about subfamilies briefly. Um, <coughs> genetics and bees is so different from humans that it almost takes a whole presentation in itself to explain this and really get it to sink in because people always jump to weird conclusions that aren't true based on some of this stuff, but um, let's, let's talk about diploid and haploid. We kind of brought this up earlier, but um, a fertilized egg is, is diploid. What that means is, is that there's two full sets of genes. So if you put this in terms of rabbits or people or, or mammals in general, um, let, let's just take people. If, you know, you, 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 you were made from a gamete from your mother, which was just a random set of, there's two sets of genes she got from both of her parents. You get a random set of those, so maybe your eye color came from her father and your <coughs> hair color came from her mother and so on and so forth, because it's just a random set of genes that came from her. Then there's a random set of genes that came from your father, so there's another gamete that's just a random set of genes based on two sets. So there's two sets, it's a random, this one or this one of each one of them going down this, these two sets. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, the number of possible combinations isn't infinite, but it's, it's huge. The number of different possible combinations of all of these chromosomes and all of these genes is pretty huge to start with. And then in recent years, of course, we've gotten into alleles, which are smaller pieces of genes than even, you know, the chromosomes that we're usually counting. And so we've got all, all this random possibility of genetics from here, random possibility of genetics here. And then those two come together to make another diploid gamete that becomes another human, right? Or whatever else we're talking about that's, that's diploid and diploid. Bees are not that way. <clears throat> all the females are diploid. They've got two sets of genes. And the only one that's reproducing is the queen, so we can kind of forget about the rest of them for the moment and just talk about the queen. So the queen's got these two sets of genes. One of them came from the drone that was her father, and the other one came from her mother, right? In some ways, you could say she really doesn't have a father because that set of genes actually came from that drone's um, mother. But um, so got, she's got two sets of genes. Now, every lay, egg she lays is a random set of those genes. Whether it's diploid or haploid, it's a random set of those genes, right? So she makes a diploid, she makes a haploid. Um, gamete that's a random set of her genes. Got that so far? Now, she's been inseminated by a whole bunch of drones. 
So she has a bunch of sperm in here. So this, the, the sperm is, is, is only haploid, so it's just one set. That matches up with that, and we've got an offspring. But she made it with a bunch of different drugs. So she has a lot of different possibilities in there, but all of the sperm from any given drone is all identical because they only have one set of genes. They can't get a random set. They only have one set. So but when a drone makes sperm, every single sperm cell is identical. It has the same set of genes. But the queen made it with maybe a dozen, maybe 20 of them. So she's got maybe 20 different sets, but that's it, just 20. Where, where uh, when you take a diploid set and take a random set, you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of possible combinations. She's only got 20 possible combinations. Now, each of these drones that she mated with creates a subfamily. In other words, they all get the same exact set of genes from this father, so they have a lot of genetic material in common. And that's what makes them this subfamily. They're, not, they're, they're more closely related than, than your siblings are because this gene is identical every time. And this set's a random set, where your siblings were a random set from the mother, a random set from the father, so there's more variety. And so they're, so these subfamilies within a colony are actually more genetically related than siblings in, in, in mammals or anything that's, that's diploid and diploid. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so that's, that's when we talk about subfamilies, that's what we're talking about. So what she's talking about is that um, the Rutner and them are saying that but some of this is this jealousy over the subfamily. They want, they want a queen from their subfamily. <clears throat> and that's what they're trying to accomplish. And when you put a queen in that's not related to anybody, it, it solves the everybody, it solves the, the them and us thing. The, the them, we're all the ones that are the subfamily of the queen, and, and we're different subfamilies, and, and, and eliminate some of that. I don't, I don't, I don't know, but that, that's as good an explanation as any. Yeah? You will. You, put, you might have 20. You have like small, so how do they actually all know each other? Because you may um, only have maybe a thousand bees a year, a thousand bees a year, a thousand bees a year. There, there's, there's been research done over the years showing that they do and they don't. You know, we've got the, the for every expert is an equal and opposite expert. But there's quite a bit of research over time that has shown that, they, that there's preferences when they're trying to raise a queen, that these workers will try to raise a queen cell from the one, from a, one that's there in their subfamily. Um, but then there's also evidence. There's also some studies that say it doesn't matter. I don't. I don't. I don't have an opinion. Whether it's inseminated or it's done naturally, and whether it's mixed with insemination where they stir it, or whether it's first in or blasted in with the lipo and fipo with the natural mating, and then it's how it breaks out on the combs like uh, <coughs> going with the salmon up they into a pond and eat. This, this, is, this, this is kind of another one of those controversial issues. I, I think it's a little of both. But um, when a queen mates with all these drones, it's going in sequentially. So the question is, is it lipo, or, which means the last in is the first out, or does it all get mixed up? Well, obviously, if you've watched colonies over time change colors, it, it's kind of obvious that it's somewhat lipo. It's somewhat... <coughs> not mixed, but it's somewhat mixed too, because you'll see for a while there'll be multiple colors emerging, and then maybe it'll all kind of shift to a different color, like they were mostly yellow, and then they start going well, mostly black. With transition zones, climatic, with your climatic changes, transitioning in and out, you have your separate, but then at one time you have your mixture where it butts, and only where it butts can you have the mixture other than that separated. Right. So, but in my opinion, it's what she just said, which is that it's somewhat lipo, but it's somewhat mixed right where the where they meet up. Um, there's some people who claim that it's just all mixed. I, I think it's obvious that it's not, because I've observed them changing color over time, and, and the only explanation I have is the, the, the drone that's being used. So now what this means for subfamilies is that the, the, the proportion of what subfamilies in, in there is often changing as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So this might be the dominant subfamily right now, and then this becomes the dominant subfamily, and then this becomes the dominant subfamily. Yeah? As far as recognition goes, there has actually been plant research that shows related seeds recognize each other and will grow their roots in opposite directions. So if plants can recognize familial connections, it must be fairly easy to produce. 
Bees are. I think that way because bees follow plant genetics. It doesn't follow hot blood and animal genetics. It's plant related, and that goes back to. Uh, Okay, so I'm, I want to talk a little bit about. Michael, actually, yeah. that's a really good question. When you, you said the behavior of the hive changes as soon as you introduce the new queen. Yes. You wouldn't expect. Does it also change as soon as you pinch the other queen? As soon as you remove that hot no, queen? No, not necessarily, no. They're usually still yeah. hot until I introduce the new queen. But I. I to me, the shock was that I didn't expect them to calm down for another six weeks, and they, and they quite often I've done that, and they calm down pretty quickly. They don't always. Sometimes it does take six weeks, but most of the time they calm down pretty quickly. And so that leads me to believe there's more, there's something more complicated happening than the genetics. I don't know what that is exactly. Yeah. We had a really, really high hive, and um, uh, we went in to do an inspection and just and move some frames around, and the next time we went back two weeks later, they weren't hot anymore, and I don't get it, but... Well, so, sometimes the move they're in that day has to do with the weather changing, or the, or the, the dearth, or, or then something bloomed, or... Yeah, bees are often not in the same mood from one time to the next time because of other things. I don't, the bees obviously sense that the weather is going to change because quite often you're looking at a sunny day and you're thinking it's nice and there's things blooming and the bees are really grouchy and you're going I don't get it and then and then that night a horrible storm blows through and then you realize oh well the bees were sensing that that storm was coming through so there, there's a lot of things that can set them off from a dearth to a bloom to a you know that, that change their mood. Yeah. So it, possibly the color changes are due to the type of drone, the type yes. of egg length. Could possibly the defensive level change as well? In a sure, but that, but that would take time. Sure, yeah. Well, that that could also have to do with it. It wasn't hot six months ago. Yeah, yeah so right. all those things are possible. Yes, yes, it could be over time that the one, another subfamily is kind of dominating and it's more defensive and, and, and actually might eventually pass. Right. And they might get nicer again. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I, I did want to bring this up. I didn't talk about it before, but I'll, let, let me mention You can go to this um, on my website, or if you just go to bushfarms.com slash bees, um, there's a link there for bee camp if you want to look at it. What I want you to do is I want you to come to my house, pay me $100 a day, and do all my work for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I call it my Tom Sawyer bee camp. Um, <laughs> But seriously, I, 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 and for those of you who don't have the $100 a day, I set up a week before that for a work week. If you want to earn a scholarship, you can come the week before and just help me with farm work. And then the next week we'll do bee work. And the next two weeks we'll do bee work. But um, seriously, a lot of people were bugging me to do this, and so I decided to, I decided to do it. Frankly, I think Dee should do this. I think she should charge people $100 a day to come out, and then she can just direct and they can do all the work for her. Yes. Um, well, I think that's a good idea for and me. I think she should do that. 365 days a year, but, <laughs> um, but I, I already know how that will go. Though D, 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 D wants it done, D wants it done right, and, <laughs> and she'll spend more effort trying to get you to do it right. <laughs> Um, but anyway, if you're if you're interested, if, if you're interested, the the. Um, Starting on the 12th is the, is the scholarship week, the work week, and then, then the next week is like the 22nd. Um, is that right? That can't be right. Maybe? I don't know. And whatever it lands. Whatever the next week is, you can look it up. What's that? May. Um, so we'll, 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 be, we'll, be, uh, we'll do some clean rearing. We're going to go do a cutout. i got a cutout lined up that needs to be done. Um, but we'll go do... Um, we'll do some splits, we'll do, we'll clean up a bunch of equipment, we'll maybe build a barn, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so let's talk about why you should rear your own queens. Um, well, there's the obvious what queens cost, but then there's... When, how much time elapses between when you need a queen and when you can get one, and sometimes you can't even get one, which would be the availability. Um, I don't think you can get bees that are really going to be very healthy 
and buy them from other people. They're just not selling good queens anymore. Everybody seems to agree on that. Nobody seems to be able to agree on why the queens aren't good anymore. But everybody seems to agree that the queens aren't any good anymore. Um, and you can raise good queens. You don't, you don't have to buy worthless queens just to have them superseded anyway. You can raise your own queens. Um, you can get bees that are more acclimatized, and you can get better quality queens. And, and I'll talk about why you can raise better quality queens than the queen breeders. <coughs> this is probably not anywhere near right now. I don't know what they're selling for, but they're selling for more than $20 now. 30 to 35 Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't take less than 50 for all the work that's involved myself. <laughs> um, so, I already talked about time. You know, all of a sudden you need a queen and you need it yesterday. If you're raising your own queens, you probably already have one in a nuke or you have some queen cells you can just go put in a hive and, and it'll emerge and they'll have a queen again. So, time is one issue. Sometimes you can't even find a queen anywhere, no matter how hard you go about it. But, um, and, and this, this seems to worry a lot of people in the South, but I know a lot of people in Florida, Texas, and New Mexico, Arizona, who are supposedly in Africanized honeybee areas who are raising their own queens. They just, they just uh, keep the gentle ones and they requeen the hot ones, and they're doing fine. In fact, I think, in my opinion, the most dangerous thing you can do in an Africanized bee area is try to keep a European honeybee in there all the time, because you'll get an F1 cross with those wild bees, and you'll end up with these vicious bees. I mean, they're not, they're not just a little defensive, they're just impossible to work. Um, and you don't want those kind of bees. Um, you're better... There's such thing as African... Yeah, yes, I know, but... <laughs> I'm telling you, just raise your own queens, and just keep the, keep the nice ones, and don't worry about whether they're Africanized or not, it doesn't matter. Just raise your own queens from the local bees, and, and, and call out the ones that aren't nice. That's, that's what I know lots of people doing this, and it's working fine for them. Um, if you live in an area that that's not even an issue, then you don't have to worry about it. <coughs> um, tracheal mite resistance is, is really easy to breed for. All you got to do is stop treating, and pretty much everybody already did, and it already went away. It's funny. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, um, if I ask a group, a typical beekeeping conference, and I said, how many of you treat for tracheal mites, about a third of them would raise their hand. Last year, I asked that at almost every place I went, and not more than two people ever raised their hand at any given meeting. Um, pretty much nobody's treating for tracheal mites. And you know what happened when everybody stopped treating for tracheal mites? It went away. <laughs> um, I don't know why it's so hard to convince them if they would stop treating for varroa, it would go away, because we already did this with tracheal mites, and it worked fine. But um, they seem to have trouble grasping that. And it's odd, because I, I've heard... Um, I've heard at least five or six bee scientists, and I'm tempted to quote all their names, but uh, maybe it wouldn't be very fair because they were just private conversations, but I've heard at least five or six of them say, if we'd never treated for Varroa, we'd already be past this. We would have been past this a decade ago. Really? <laughs> In fact, I can't think of too many of them I haven't heard say something to that effect. <coughs> But the problem is you have this, these commercial guys who don't want to take the losses that it would take to do that. But the fact is they have taken those losses. That's why I don't understand why they keep insisting that this is working. Because treating isn't working. You know, Dave Mendez and some of these guys have lost all of their bees a couple of times. And, and all you had to do was quit treating and you, maybe you'd only lost half of them. And, and by now you'd be back on the road to recovery. But um, they don't seem to be willing to do that. So that's that's probably why the that's, that's probably why the scientists don't want to uh, get on that bandwagon. Yes. Um, the, the the fact is the success of your queens is too important to the success of your beekeeping to leave that to people who really don't have a stake in it. The people who are raising queens and selling them are trying to put their kids through college. They're not trying to get you good queens. They're just trying to get a bunch of queens so that they can sell them so they can. <coughs> pay for their kids' college. They're not, they're, they're not trying to raise the best possible queens. They're trying to raise a lot of queens. It's what, uh, what Ronald Reagan said once when somebody asked him why he was in these horrible B movies. He said they didn't want it good. They wanted it Tuesday. <laughs> well, these guys raising queens, don't, they don't care if they're good. They just care that they've got queens to ship out on Tuesday. 
and, and that's what they're doing. And I'm not blaming them for trying to feed their family and doing what they're doing. They, they have a hard time making a living unless they convinced everybody that they had premium queens. They wouldn't be able to charge enough to be worth the trouble. But you're raising your own queens. You can take the time and the trouble to have better queens than they will raise for you. Um, I think it's really unreasonable to expect bees to bring the bees out to do well in the north. I, I really have trouble understanding the people who insist that it makes no difference where the bees are from. There are people out there who keep insisting on that. There's actually been a couple of SAR grants done on this, one of them in Maine and one of them in Virginia, where they bought a bunch of packages and put them in this control group over here and just installed them and left them managed them the same both sides. But then they took a bunch of packages and installed them in this other group and they requeened all of them with local queens. And the ones requeened with local queens had extremely good winter overwintering. And the ones that weren't requeened with local queens had terrible overwintering. I don't remember the exact numbers, but there was a very dramatic difference in the outcome. And they did this in Maine, they did it again in Virginia. <coughs> I think bees that are locally acclimatized are essential to really succeeding at beekeeping. As long as your bees are from Georgia and you're in Nebraska, you don't have a real good chance of success. If, you're, if your bees are at least, if you're in Nebraska where it's that cold, if your bees are at least from a cold climate, you're at least a step in the right direction. But ideally, you want the local feral bees. Those are the ones that are acclimatized to your climate. They're the ones that are already surviving. They've got the traits you want other than if they're not gentle or they're not productive, you might do a little selection. Yeah. I know a gentleman and he got a bunch of calves out of Wyoming and brought them to Texas. And he said they don't do as well in Texas because they're not used to the heat dying. So That's probably true. the same way they you get them too far out of their zone there and they, they don't do well. I mean you put me in Texas, I'm not <laughs> So even if you don't get local stock, if you if you at least if you at least breed from your commercial stock and let them breed with the bees from your area and you breed from the ones that are at least surviving the winter in your area, you're going to be headed in the right direction. But ideally, you really want to get local feral survivors. That would be the ideal. Um, quality. You can raise much better quality queens, and here's why. The first thing that, that hurts quality is that they raise them too soon. And that's, I can't blame, again, I'm not blaming the queen breeders for doing that. They're doing that because the beekeepers keep demanding them sooner. The beekeepers want a bunch of queens so that they can do splits really early. And so the bee breeders raise queens way too early. There's not enough drones. There's not enough good weather for them to get bred. And so they end up with bees, that, with queens that aren't very well fed. They're not very well bred. And, and so they're obviously not going to be that great. Um, it, it, over and over, there, there, there was a... I, I won't call it a contest exactly, but it was sort of a contest that the USDA was running. They had all these queen breeders sending them queens and they were evaluating them on which ones were the best. This one guy would consistently send them queens that were by far the best. And they would raise queens off of these queens, the USDA would, by their methods of raising queens, and they would just be ordinary, mediocre queens. I mean, they weren't bad queens, but they weren't outstanding queens. But they were outstanding queens when they get, whenever they get queens from this breeder, they were always outstanding queens. And they couldn't figure out what the difference was. Finally, they had to conclude that it's the way he raises his queens that made them better queens, not the genetics. Um, if a queen is well-fed and well-bred, she's going to make a much better queen, no matter what the genetics are, compared to a queen that's not well-fed and not well-bred. Now, I'm not saying genetics isn't helpful, and it is, the genetics is good, but the fact is, you can have the best genes in the world, and if that queen's not well-fed and not well-bred, she's going to be a mediocre queen at best. So you not only want good genetics, you want her to be well-fed and well-bred. How do you make sure she's well-fed and well-bred? If you raise her when you see a lot of drones flying, the bees don't raise drones unless there's plenty of resources coming in. And the fact that you see drones flying pretty much proves two things. One, there's enough drones to get her well-bred, and two, there's enough resources to get her well-fed. Yes? The only thing with that is they put all their eggs in one basket for the main clothes, and every race of plant and animal on earth, including bees, breaks out by its own temperature range to be separate. But you don't put all, every, all your eggs in one basket. And so you've got bees that breed early spring, some that be, breed early late, some that breed with main flows, and you've got to know how to time it for your area for when they fly. And other than that, you're not going to have any success. 
Oh, I, I find if I don't wait until the Bruce drones are flying in my highs, I don't, I don't get, uh, I don't get decent control. success. Go ahead. I'm wondering, like in the like <laughs> 70s and 80s, I mean the Hawaiian queen thing was kind of ruled the roots. I mean John Powers and all that went to the Big Island and was raising queens. Well, I, I still, still think they are. I, I sold 500 knives I had over there. Where do you think they got them? Okay. Well, I mean, what was the result of all that, you know, because you're saying it's kind of being more low, or you get a Hawaiian queen, an equatorial type thing, and then you bring it to North Dakota, what's the result of that? It has to change. It's no longer Hawaiian. It has to change. The downside was they weren't acclimatized. The upside was, in Hawaii, almost any time of the year they get well fed. And they get well bred because there's plenty of drones flying all year round. No, there is not. I was over there for seven years. I'm not saying I want any Hawaiian queens, so let's just let's just move on. Because <laughs> I, I definitely am not interested in getting any, so it, it's it's not my topic here. Um, it, you can not only do it at the right time when they're when there's when they can get well bred and well fed. You can do it. Um, you, you can leave them in the mating nuke longer, and or you can just introduce them directly to the hive you want to put them in. <coughs> There's several research studies on this. One of them is just specifically on their ovarial development. One of them is uh, specifically on just how well accepted they are by the bees and, 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 uh, and successful they are based on how long you wait between when that queen gets put in the mating nuke and when you uh, pull her out put her in a queen bank and or introduce her to a hive and cage her or whatever. The research shows that if you give her at least uh, 21 days after you put that cell in the mating nuke, if you wait 21 days, her ovarials are going to come to full development and she's going to be a better queen, period. She's going to make more pheromones, she's going to be better accepted, She's going to have, and, and she's going, and she's just going to be a better queen. She's going to be more. She'll have more longevity because she's better bred and she makes more pheromones. One of the things they measured was the longevity. One of the things they measured was the acceptance. The other thing they measured was the ovarial development. These are two different studies, but um, those are the, the three things between the two studies that they looked at. But what happens if you cage her as soon as she's laid an egg or two? Is that you interrupt that ovarial development and then she never it never finishes, it never completes, it stops. That's it. It stunts her ovarial development and she'll never be a very good queen. So one of the reasons that the queens you're buying aren't very good is because they've interrupted that ovarial development. Because they go through there two weeks after they put the cell in, they just grab them and stick them in a cage and they don't even bother to look to see if there's eggs usually. Some of them might bother to look to see eggs, but some of them I, I've talked to people who were in bee yards and saw them gathering queens and asked them. I said, aren't you going to look for queen, look for eggs? And they said, I don't care if there's eggs. They just stuck them in a the cage and shipped them off. Um, so you can make sure that they get to lay for at least three weeks. You know, that at least you left them in the mating nuke for three weeks. Or you introduce the cell directly to the hive you wanted to requeen, and then she just emerged and started laying. And you never interrupted her, her ovarial development or her laying. Um, that's one of the reasons you can raise much better quality queen. 